This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I draw on analytic 
philosophy of science, cognitive science, uh, philosophy of emotion, which is a very, uh, well, actually multifaceted field. Uh, there is uh, more analytic approaches to emotion, more experiential, phenomenological ones. I am actually very much interested in phenomenology. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, phenomenology quite a lot today in my talk. For those of you who have uh, one of the media Phenomenology, to be simply, is a philosophical tradition that some associate mainly with uh, French and German philosophy, but it's an artificial uh, geographical division. But phenomenologists are particularly interested in providing descriptions of experience, descriptions of lived experience. And um, I was quite uh, excited actually when we, yesterday you began to introduce this whole event and say we need to talk more about experience. And phenomenologists definitely say that. In fact, for phenomenologists, before you do any science, you have to provide a you know, kind of rich, complex uh, description of what you want to eventually explain scientifically. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I also uh, I like to read um, beyond philosophy and the humanities. So I, I, I read philosophy and the science of emotion, and I try to think uh, how can we mix, uh, well, how can philosophy contribute to science, and how can science contribute to philosophy. Okay, so moving on then to the plan of my talk, it's really quite uh, simple. I'm going to first introduce the notion of body memory. And I must say, this is a bit of a strange move. I, I confess, when I, when I was invited and you told me, oh, you know, this conference is emotion, mind, emotion, and memory, I thought, okay, mind, emotion, I worked on that. Memory, I haven't really done anything about it. So am I supposed to put these things together, or can I just, you know, <laughs> stick with emotion? The second day of emotion. But I thought, okay, I'm going to make an effort and try to put uh, some memory in it as well. And then I was thinking about my current research and I thought, well, there is a sense in which what I'm doing now is also about memory. Although um, not uh, in the way that we, we heard it yesterday. So I'm going to explain, well, we will see what I mean as I well in my talk. So, so I'm going to introduce this notion of body memory as it's been uh, proposed uh, in uh, mainly phenomenology. I'm going to focus on and then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to um, say something about the relation between body memory and affectivity. Um, and um, the overall aim of my talk is going to be to invite you to think of memory in a new way, I say here, perhaps in a way, because maybe some of you have already heard these ideas, but if not, maybe they are going to be a kind of a, oh, no, I never thought that memory could also be conceptualized in, in this way. Present. And also, I'm going to um, try to um, argue that me or memory is actually very close, closely linked with affectivity. In fact, I think it's a thoroughly affected. Okay, so let's begin then. Sorry, this is my presentation. It's just for this part of the talk. The, the idea of body memory. Okay, so actually, um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to review this very thick book, uh, which is I don't, sorry. Body memory metaphor and movement, and was edited by a psychologist, a psychiatrist, Thomas Fuchs, who also has interest in phenomenology, a philosopher, interested in Husserl, in phenomenology, and a linguist. And um, this, uh, in this volume, the editors uh, um, say that well, memory is not just the capacity to explicitly recall the past, but memory is also be implicitly ingrained in our present body skills and actions. So this interesting idea that you know, there is a sense in which the present is a form of memory, the present way in which I am, as we will see, is a form of memory. And this, um, this uh, idea, as the editors pointed out, has philosophical roots that go back, for example, to the French uh, philosopher Henri Bergson, who in uh, 1896 published the volume called Matter and Memory. And uh, in this volume, Bergson distinguished between what he calls souvenir image and uh, memoir habitude. So souvenir image is, uh, to put it simply, an imagistic form of memory. If I ask you, you know, what, what did you have for uh, breakfast this morning, you're going to conjure up some images, perhaps not picture-like images, but you're going to have some kind of uh, explicit recollection that is somehow imagistic. You know, similar if I ask you where well, uh, last uh, summer, how was the beach, things like that. Um, memoir habitude, or habit memory, as it's translated into English, for the song was the act of remembering via repetition. 
as it occurs in learning by Rota, or in uh, learning to play an instrument, or you have to repeat the act of playing again and again until it is ingrained or taken into the body. <coughs> Um, of Memoir de Tout has been then developed by another French philosopher, Merleau Ponty, who is uh, largely influenced by Bergson. In Merleau Ponty, in his uh, text, Phenomenology of Perception, he doesn't talk about what the English is translated as body memory, but he talks a lot about what he calls the habitual body. So I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, in, the, in the next few minutes, and hopefully uh, this will show a link with this idea that memory is somehow ingrained in our bodies. Now, Mary Ponty is a kind of complicated philosopher, uh, but uh, the best uh, way into his approach is to juxtapose it with uh, another famous French philosopher, <laughs> uh, René Descartes. So René Descartes uh, is famous, uh, as you probably all know here, for claiming that uh, the cogito I assume, I think, therefore I am. So with Descartes was, in his meditations, he was thinking, what is the only thing I can be certain of? Well, is the thing that I am now doubting uh, anything else, but uh, yes, I'm doubting, so I cannot possibly doubt the fact that I'm doubting. So I must be a doubting, i.e. a thinking thing. So Descartes' philosophy very much identifies the mind with the activity of thinking. Descartes said that, that uh, we are, in fact, uh, thinking things, the mind is a thinking substance, and the body is something external to the mind, is something mechanical, is something that science can study, and that you know interacts with the mind. But subjectivity for Descartes is identified primarily with this thinking substance. Now, Merleau-Ponty is strongly you know, opposed to this idea of subjectivity as being this kind of disembodied thinking activity. Um, Merleau Ponty would say, you are not a thinking thing, I am primarily a bodily being. And um, if I ask myself, what is it that I cannot doubt? Well, I cannot doubt that I experience myself as a bodily being. I experience myself as a being that has uh, the capacities to act, uh, to move in the world. So for the uh, for Merleau Ponty, the kind of essence of subjectivity is not thought immaterial thought, but is bodily possibilities of action. So the, the subject is not, is not an I think, but it is an I can. So importantly for the body, the body that I am then is not a thing, is not like, not like any other physical object in the world, but it is a subject, a subject of experience. So if you're a phenomenologist, you start from the question, okay, so how do I, how does my body appear to me in experience? And you think about my body, I can look at my hand, and at the same time I can look at objects out there. But I don't really experience my hands like in the same way in which I experience this glass out there. Rather, I experience my hand as that in which I can do things in the world. So I experience my hand, in a point, you would say, as a, a locus of subjectivity. And this is very much the idea of the lived body, the body that I am is an experienced body. And German, for those of you who know German, has a very nice way of uh, capturing this distinction between the body as a kind of a, a physical object and the body as a lived uh, a being. And that's the German, you know, the, the term for the first type of body is Körper. So all these objects are very the same as Körper, it's just physical bodies. But the body that I am is alive, is a lived, living and lived body. And in fact, phenomenologists uh, also before Merle Ponty precisely used these German terms to make that uh, important distinction between different modalities in which the body appears in experience. Right, so and here we are now starting to move into the body memory. So Merle Ponty in his work also emphasizes that the body that I am is subject to a process of habituation. And the process of habituation happens through sedimentation. So let me then unpack these terms um, next. So the notion of habituation is certainly best illustrated by the learning of um, many different skills, such as um, from the start, the capacity to stand up, the capacity to walk, um, the capacity to um, ride a bicycle, tie, play an instrument, climb, dance. You see a nice <coughs> performance yesterday of someone who has definitely habituated a certain skill. And what is characteristic of 
with the um, habits is that they are performed on what you would say spontaneously or even that are created collectively. What does it mean? Well, is that once you have them upgraded or taken into the body, you don't need to continuously reflect on what you're doing to perform the skin. Uh, so there is no need for this kind of continuous, continuous self observation. So I quite like this picture here of a man walking down the stairs by looking at his iPad. And clearly, his attention is all on the iPad. He's email and he's possibly probably not thinking oh now I have to move my left leg to walk down the stair now it's the time for the right leg he just has incorporated or taken into his body the idea of walking down the stairs so he just does it spontaneously so what we emphasize is that habituation is something that happens over time and he uses this uh, uh, geological term sedimentation which really wants to emphasize the depth of this uh, phenomenon of, of habituation. It's not just a superficial thing that you know, there something, but it's something that builds up over time and also builds up onto other skills that we learn in development. So, formal of the body that I am is also something that gradually accumulates skills. And so, my body skills at any time are the product, product of my body's layered past. Although the image of a layer itself is not accurate, right? Because it's not that we accumulate skills one on top of the other, but as I uh, incorporate a, I don't know, the skill to perhaps uh, um, walk down the stairs, at the same time this will influence the way we incorporate the skill to you know, uh, climb down a very steep um, hill. So there is a sense in which these things may then uh, uh, con consolidate one another. Now, this land is a quintessentially Merleau-Pontian thought. So when Merleau-Ponty talks about the living body, he doesn't want to talk just about the body. He thinks that you, when you talk about the living body, you also have to talk about the way in which the world opens up for you uh, as a bodily being. So Merleau-Ponty, well, it's, uh, if you read Merleau-Ponty, he's, uh, he's not an easy philosopher to read. He uses lots of strange uh, terminology and it's not systematic. He doesn't it doesn't say, okay, this is what I mean by habituation. So you have to kind of extrapolate it from the text. So often, you know, you have to kind of make sense of strange things that he says. But you know, one thing he says again and again is that the lift body is that in front of which the world shows up for me in the way it does. So I think one way to understand this uh, that um, you know, makes it easier for me is to think of the lift body as that through which you experience the world. And this is very well seen in the case of touch, right? When you when you hold uh, something like a glass of water, I experience that it is uh, hard and smooth through my hand. So the glass shows up for me in experience as smooth and hard through my body, through the experience I have of my hand. Or if you, if you look at this cup, for example, you would say that I experience this cup as something that I can grasp. And I do so because my body, I experience my body as a body that can grasp. So my the, the sense I have that I have of my bodily abilities um, is very closely interlinked with the experience I have of the world and of what the world, uh, some psychologists some would say, affords me. But you know what the world invites me to do is correlated with if you want is really the other side of this capacity that I have to make that things in the world with my body. So an implication of this is that as my body changes, its relation to the world changes as well. And relatedly, my experience of the world changes in terms of what I can do in the world. And I think um, a very good example of this is the learning to climb. So if you learn to climb, you learn, of course, the variety of body skills. You have to learn to um, place your feet in a certain way of the holes. You have to learn to move your hips in relation to the wall. So you have to ingrain a variety of uh, body skills, but at the same time, as you do so, the world that you perceive changes. So, um, I don't know if there's any climber here, but uh, it's typical when you start climbing and you look around and you start to walk up there, but doing this and that. But so you, for example, once you learn how to climb, uh, a rock face that would have previously looked impassable, uh, may start to look climbable. So you, you then change the perception of how you see it. 
So in some so far, then the lesson from the local G is that <coughs> my body is an ever-changing entity that also continuously changes in relation to the lived world, the, the world as I experience it. And the body that I am now is a process, is the product of a long process of segmentation of skills and of habits of acting and interacting with the world. And so my present body, so this is where the notion of body memory I think can be seen. My present body um, is itself a form of memory. Because by being as it is, with its structure and skills, and by acting in the world as it does, my body, in a sense, remembers what it has learned and also how it has interacted with the world. So before I move on to affectivity, I also want to introduce one more neural function idea, which I'm going to use uh, later. And this is a fascinating notion uh, that somehow relates to what I mentioned at the beginning, the idea that the mind might even be able to expand um, in the world. Uh, there is something like that, perhaps. So this is the notion of object incorporation. That's uh, in the local this idea that objects can be taken into the experience of one's own body. So famous example that the local key discusses together with other examples is the one of the blind person's cane. So a blind person is used to uh, using a stick to walk around and to explore the world, has habituated to the cane, to the point that the cane is experienced as just another organ of perception. Uh, in the case of the cane, it's fascinating how there is also a shift in the locus of sensation so that the, the person experiences the world at the tip of the cane. So the cane really has been taken into or incorporated into the lived body. It's become part of this subject of experience. It's not anymore an object out there for neural body. So the blind person's cane is experienced not as an external tool, but as part of the body, as an organ of Now here it might be harder to see the relation to body memory. I'm trying to think about it uh, because I'm talking for body memory here. Um, so these are some some ideas um, kind of tentative, but there we go. So I think that the relation here is that the body habituates not just in the sense that it learns and remembers uh, um, uh, to move in certain ways, but the body also integrates objects into itself. And by taking an object into itself. The body remembers, in a sense, it retains a certain relation to the object. That's the idea that uh, I can use it to work with. Okay, so now another transition towards part two of the talk, where I was looking to the study of affectivity, and I want to reflect on the relation between affectivity and body memory. So first, let me say something about what I mean by affectivity. Actually, I prefer the word affectivity to emotion. I actually have a very broad understanding of affectivity. The word affectivity literally means apt, so it comes from the Latin, and it means the capacity to be done something, to sort of be influenced by something, to be struck by something. So psychologically, I think the root of affectivity really is the idea that uh, we are not indifferent to things that affect us. As affective beings, we have a kind of capacity to care about what happens to us. So for me, affectivity is this general lack of indifference that we have as living in the organisms. So there are a variety of affective states, and emotions, I think, is just a subset of affectivity. So what are emotions? Emotions, I'm not going to try to give a definition, uh, but uh, uh, emotion can be seen as this capacity to undergo specific emotional episodes, which is you know, English speakers for happiness, sadness, fear, anger, envy, pride, shame, and many others. And then there are affective states that are seen as not really emotions, but you know, things like moods, being depressed, anxious, uh, irritability, feeling down or feeling up, feeling elated, relieved, uh, discouraged. Um, there are not many things on which uh, philosophers usually agree upon, but when it comes to the distinction between emotions and moods, there is quite a broad agreement, and philosophers tend to say that the difference is that emotions typically are about specific objects or events or situations. So I would uh, be, you know, I'm usually scared of something like scared of a snake or scared of uh, having to give a talk or I'm angry at my neighbor, I'm envious of my rival. But when it comes to moods, 
can we say that one is depressed about something in particular? Well, there's general agreement that it's not really the case. When you're depressed, you are in a kind of a feeling state that uh, colors perhaps uh, a variety of uh, situations you encounter, but you are not really depressed about anything in particular. Some people say you are depressed about the world in general. Some people say you are not really depressed about anything. There is a bit of a debate about this, but at least in general, you know, that these effective states are different. Also, I am actually quite happy to include motivational states in the realm of affectivity, things like hunger, thirst, lust, pain. Uh, and that's because when we are in these states, we are not really indifferent to what's going on. Uh, obviously, if you are thirsty, you know, you are driven, um, you, you, you are affected by your state, and you want to drink, for example. And by the way, I also think that emotions and needs can motivate, but uh, um, so I don't mean these factors to be no longer in time, no longer in time. It's just a way of trying to show the multifaceted aspect of the realm of affectivity. Okay, so now how does affectivity then relate to body memory? Right, so I think that uh, the relation will not be a simple one because neither affectivity nor body memory are you know, simple phenomena. So, as a general statement, it seems to me that we can say that body memory is affective, and I can explain which sense, and at least that certain aspects of affectivity, certain affective states or processes involve body memory. So what I'm going to do now is uh, try to unpack this idea by throwing a variety of uh, quite sparse ideas. Um, and um, so just uh, I'm going to announce this idea now, now at a glance, and I'm going to unpack them in the rest of the talk. And these ideas, I listed them in, uh, in an order that strikes me as being from the most obvious to the least obvious. So, well, it seems to me that you know, an obvious way in which body memory and affectivity are related is that expressions of emotions and moods are a form of body memory. I'm going to um, yeah, elaborate on this thing. The body can also remember, can remember pain and trauma. Then I also would want to say that the habitual body notion that we've seen in neural body, which is can be really a synonymous of body memory, is normative, and you know, I don't understand what I mean. And then finally, I also want to come back to this idea of the incorporation of objects into the body. And I want to argue that objects can be effectively incorporated into the habitual body. Okay, let's begin then with the, you know, the expression of emotion. Uh, well, the expression of emotions in our body. Scientists have studied for quite a while now. Um, our face is uh, a major locus for the expression of emotion. The top row up here, um, I don't know how well you can see, but uh, this is, um, uh, these are so called something that is like basic emotions. And um, uh, the idea is that basic emotions are expressed in the face uh, in the same way or very similar way across cultures. Interestingly, lists of basic emotions vary, and this is what are typical ones. So, angry, content, disgust, fear, happy, and sad. They come with the name of facial expressions. I mean, I quite like this picture though, because it also picture that said, well, actually, we, we have other emotions too, and they are also expressed in the face. So, this is a problem. Confused, impressed, not convinced, bothered, problem solving. Well, interesting, this could just be seen all as emotions. Well, in any case, they seem to be expressed on the face. Of course, one would argue, well, these are not, probably not culturally shared. The point is just that, you know, they're out there, out there in the body. Now, let's say it's fascinating. If you, if you are on the internet and you want to go on Google Image and you Google emotion, expression of emotion, you just find a list of faces. And it's fascinating for me. I'm Italian, so I just, I'm kind of <laughs> quite familiar with the idea that is also the rest of the body that is involved in emotional communication. So this is a picture of Italian gestures. And uh, I am not embarrassed to show this picture. It's a picture of uh, Dolce and Gabbana models. But uh, I was looking for pictures from scientific papers of uh, um, cross-cultural differences in body expression of emotion. And it was very hard to find. So what I, I you know, exasperated, I typed in Italian gestures, and the first thing that came up was this. But it always makes sense to me, I, I recognize these gestures. And um, I also thought, given that yesterday was you know, such a, the first one was very entertaining, I thought, I can, I'm not going to start 
and acting this. But I'm sure you know, what comes with that picture, which is really fascinating.
you're not really entirely capturing the difference between someone who has undergone trauma and someone who has not. So suppose it's not someone who has not undergone trauma, the difference between me and a traumatized person is not just that, you know, in a certain situation this person would have a panic attack and I will not. Rather, there is a whole, a whole more existential dimension to uh, pain and traumatic memory. And that includes the fact that trauma affects how the person experiences the world and the possibilities of acting in the world. So remember, the, the, the I for neuroblocky is an I can. So if your body changes, that changes the relation you have to the world as well, and thereby also the sense of what you can do in the world and what the world offers to you. So it seems to me that what characterizes people with pain or traumatic memory is also a pervasive sense of vulnerability, a sense of the world as threatening. And a traumatized person may not always Reenact that results of panic or pain, but when you know, even when she does not, he or his or, his or her experience of the world uh, will have changed. And I have here just two paintings from the two Italian um, artists. But I, I like these paintings because they strike me as being, you know, they are able to convey a change in mood, not by portraying any body expression, but just portraying how the world appears to someone who has undergone a certain what might be in, a, in an older state of mood. So in this painting, the world has a strange perspective, or appears kind of flat, and people are just shadows. So these are landscapes that don't invite interaction, they really appear distanced. So I think if you see the world in this way, that also means that you experience your body in a certain way. You don't experience your body, for example, as being open and uh, enticed uh, towards interacting with the objects and, uh, and people. Now I want to move on to the idea that uh, body memory is normative, which I think is another way in which body memory and affectivity are really closely related. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is the idea that our body habits, um, the specific values that have been ingrained by a more or less explicit rules into our ways of acting and feeling. So if you look at this girl up here, she's, you know, she's very well behaved, she's obviously been trained in the in the right way, as opposed to another person here. But how does she get to that stage? You know, how does she habituate that posture? Obviously, through a lot of uh, scolding, encouragement. Uh, so affect affectivity is playing a huge role there. And I mean, it is also important here, you know, from um, um, experimental research that uh, we constantly imitate, uh, as we, we can do imitate other people in, in the face, with the body. But interestingly, we imitate people more when we want to affiliate with them. So there is a sense in which the kind of habits that we develop through memory may mimicry also involve affectivity. So yes, the position of body habits is that affectivity molded via a variety of strategies. And we gradually develop a, a way of doing things and also the sense of the right and wrong way of doing things through affectivity. So it's not just that, say, body expressions or emotions are a form of body memory. Um, the link between affectivity and body memory can be seen, I think, in any habitual action. The way in which I move now, the kind of being I am, in which I, which I stand, you know, it's been molded through also these affective episodes of my mind saying, you know, just stay upright, you know, just don't slouch, you know, all sorts, all sorts of rules have been uh, engraved into my, my body in posture and stance right now. Okay, and then finally, then I want to. Um, um, I think I must have about 10, 8 minutes. So I lost the time. Uh, yeah, we started late, maybe 5 minutes. Yeah, okay. So I want to go back to this idea of object incorporation. So remember, this was the phenomenon that I've talked about of the object, uh, of well, our capacity to take objects into the experience of our body. So coming to experience objects as if they were part of our body. <coughs> What's the relation with affectivity here? Well, I think there is a one uh, relative, relatively obvious one. Incorporated objects presumably become particularly salient and valued as that through which we can have certain experiences of the world. So, presumably, the blind person uh, values the cane uh, as something that enables uh, her or her to open up the world in a certain way. So, in the same way in which we care about our body, we come to care about these parts of objects that are very much integrated into our body. So 
So we can't care about these incorporated objects and objects that have become part of our subjective experience inside. But then also there is um, something else I want to point out, and this is the idea that objects can also be incorporated into our practices of affective self-regulation. Or again, from developmental psychology, that uh, um, children they, they go through stages where they really attach to certain objects, and presumably they lose those uh, because they are getting important role in comforting and regulating their moods. But even when we become older, we keep doing this. Uh, we can do it in a very sophisticated way by building musical instruments and learning how to play them. And um, musicians, of course, they, should, they play for many different reasons. But, the, but they also play, when, when they know how to play, they often play to regulate their mood. I once uh, um, was, uh, I heard an interview with a pianist, uh, Christina Orchids, who was saying, you know, I couldn't live without the piano. If you take a piano away from me, it would be my death, she said, because I, whatever happens in my life, depression, anxiety, the death of loved ones, I go to the piano and I work through my emotions. I enact, I articulate, I live through my emotions uh, with the piano. So here, here's this, I think, is a nice example in which an artifact and an agent become tightly coupled and together they allow a certain um, affective experience and <coughs> articulation of holding a certain affective experience. But then, you know, even without, uh, you know, cafe is a good example, I think, of an affective incorporation. You know, probably a more. Most academics are addicted to cafe. Um, but we, we discover how important caffeine is for us when you know, we can't access it. So this is a case again in which we have incorporated a certain, in this case, chemical substance into our way of doing things and into our way of regulating our affectivity. So these are different uh, modalities, I think, of uh, incorporation of objects into our affective space. This is kind of incorporation between expressivity, the act of expressing um, affective states, this is more a case of perhaps a physiological incorporation. And there might be others as well. So again, you know, maybe what is the relation to body memory here? And again, I'm trying, you know, it's, it's a bit vague here, but I, I, I try and still um, looking for the right uh, words here, but that's the way I see it. You know, in this case, the body acquires a certain habitual relation to an object and a certain habitual way of uh, feeling when coupled or intimately tied to this object. And when the object is not present, the body seeks to establish its relation to it. That's also, that's also quite visible in convictions. But even if you're not addicted to something, I think you just develop this habit of doing something for your emotion in relation to this object. And so if the object is not there, you're going to have to, this, this tendency, this uh, propension towards the object. So there is a memory, I think, here uh, that through habituation is ingrained into the body of a certain affective relation with an object. Okay, so now I'm coming to the, the last slide. So just like to kind of recapitulate the picture that I've tried to convey in this, in this talk. So the overall picture is that we are not simply, well, simply, it's not really simply, but you know, we're not simply biological entities that grow and change with age experience feelings, pain, pleasure, emotions. I mean, of course, we are these things, and it's quite complicated to figure out what kind of biology is more complex in our emotional experience. But what I've, um, you know, by drawing on the team, what I try to convey is that we are also we are sedimented with bodies. And as such, we are the ever-changing product of our activities and interactions with the world. And so how we behave, feel, and relate to the world now is the result of this very deep process of sedimentation. So this is, you know, I think a form of memory, although this is a body memory that is itself thoroughly affective in that sense of normative that I'm trying to explain, and that also characterizes our affective ways of doing the world, our emotional and motivational ways of doing the world as Emotional expression. And I think that was it.